Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Lisa and I am responsible for the marketing at Torchbox, which includes organising and planning our events. And I am particularly excited about this one because we do have a very special guest joining us, who is Theo Ratcliffe, the head of website at Oxfam. So hello, Theo. Hello. Um, and also we have Katie today, who is your hostess with the mostess in her role as Parky. And Katie is a product director at Torchbox. So hello, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Theo and Katie worked really closely together on the replatforming of Oxfam. <clears throat> Um, flagship website and so they're going to be sharing their experiences and their learnings with you and they're keen to answer any questions that you have so please do use the Q&A facility or the chat that you should be able to see at the bottom of the screen and um, we're going to be answering any questions at the end of the session. Um, we also have Tom Dyson joining us today who you can see now but he's not actually presenting this morning he is here to answer any particularly techie questions that we might have at the end of the session so hi Tom. Hi everyone. Um, so as Tom was just saying, um, in terms of the format, this is a webinar, so you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, and we've got 60 minutes and quite a lot to get through. So if we do miss any questions that you've asked, then I will send the answers in a follow up email afterwards. And I think that's about it. So I'm going to hand over to Katie now to get things going. Thank you very much for the introduction, Lisa. Well, hello and welcome everybody. Um, great to see so many of you here. Um, and I know from sort of personal experience, um, the decision to redesign and replatform um, can be quite daunting um, and often sort of fraught with complexities, uh, particularly in larger organisations. Um, and in a landscape where budgets are really tight, um, particularly in the, the year that we've had to date, um, and user expectations are, are sky high. Um, it's really crucial to make the right decisions um, and for the process to run smoothly so ultimately you can um, achieve your goals as an organisation. So um, as Lisa says, what we wanted to do today was just share some of the learnings and insights um, from Theo uh, based on re uh, Oxfam's recent experience of replatforming. Um, so Theo, welcome, welcome. Um, great to have you here. Um, yep. Could you just start us off by telling us a little bit more about your role at Oxfam and and in as part of the recent um, redesign? Yes. So um, I've worked for Oxfam for about 18 years uh, since kind of before we had much of a website to speak of. Um, I remember in the like when I first started, if we had to put up an appeal form for for an emergency, we'd have to phone. British Telecom to publish it and I don't, can't quite remember why we had to do that um, uh, but hopefully we've come a long way since then. So uh, when I first started I was um, the senior web producer which meant I kind of built campaigns and ran the web production team but for the last uh, 18 months or two years I've been the head of website so I'm now looking at the direction of it and overseeing the technology we use and I think from like the first week of taking on that role I kicked off the, pro the project to replace our existing system, which I think gives you an insight into the kind of relationship I had with it. Um, so yeah, that's me, but thank you very much for having me. I think it'll be a therapeutic session for me, quite cathartic. <laughs> and could you just tell us a little bit about um, the situation you were in before on your previous site? Yeah, so we used, uh, we used Sitecore, used it for about 10 years, um, but uh, it was a very heavily customised version of Sitecore. And Sitecore, if people don't know, Sitecore is an enterprise level um, kind of proprietary CMS. So it's it's um, powerful, but does come with a price tag. And as I say, we built a like heavily modified version of it because Oxfam, I think, felt it had some quite hard requirements, a lot of which seemed to revolve around a CRM, internal database. So we had the agency we worked with uh, kind of throw the box away dismantle it and glue it back together again as a kind of Frankenstein's content management system. Uh, to the extent that I remember going on a training course at Sitecore HQ and about halfway through the day, putting my hand up completely bewildered because it looked like it didn't bear any resemblance to the tools I was using at work. Um, but we, so we used this kind of diabolical creation to run our, our main website, our online shop and a small, uh, website of research papers called policy and practice um, and I think the rationale for for them all using the same tool was good in that it would obviously save money potentially but with the idea the idea was that we'd all become a 
kind of uh, greater than the sum of our parts. But in fact, uh, it ended up that each, each site, and they were all very different sites, they ended up they had dependencies on each other. So when there was an issue with one, they kind of all had problems. So um, they became, we had a lot of stability problems. Mm. So in a kind of entirely predictable plot twist, we, uh, we found the number of bugs were increasing. Uh, we ended up spending very little of our time introducing new features and more and more time kind of negotiating with each other about whose website should be fixed first. Uh, and so um, new hardware requirements, quite expensive ones would, would appear. And we had more and more technical debt, tech, technical debt grew, support became difficult and it just became untenable. But the, the headline issue with that is that it was, wasn't a sustainable technology in the sense that <clears throat> it was just too expensive to change anything. And, uh, it, and it became very unstable, as I said, um, and we need to change, we need to innovate and we need to change all the time and we just couldn't do it. So we ended up using other systems, often, often open source systems, we use WordPress a lot to kind of plug gaps in it and we injected code in it to, to fill gaps. And yeah, we have a lot of, if you look at our, if you looked at our website previously, you'd find yourself going from one platform to another, perhaps not, perhaps unwittingly, because we'd tie these things together just to get, get the job done. But yeah, so it wasn't great. It does sound like a pretty challenging situation to find yourself in. Um, but was there a particular sort of event or point in time where you decided that you needed to, to make a move, make, make that change? Yeah, so my, I think my team felt the writing was on the wall for the system uh, for quite some time. Um, we were having to kind of employ ever more curious workarounds. Uh, I remember one occasion when there was a, I think it was a typhoon somewhere about in probably early 2019, when um, we found that we just couldn't, we couldn't publish anything. I can't remember if it was when we, when we couldn't log in or whether it was just when anything we published made everything fall over. So we had to do things like, to respond to that emergency, we had to use AB testing software, set up a, a kind of, set up an ex a mock experiment, crank one of the variants up to 100% and kind of superimpose the content on our site. And that went on for about 10 days. Uh, and I think the for the wider organization, I think minds became focused by an issue we had with an upgrade. So um, we'd already kind of started a ball rolling on a re investigating replacements, but we found there, there were, we were trying to get this like Frankenstein's monster um, that had been built to up, go on its its uh, defined upgrade path, and we just couldn't do it. There was too 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 much complexity. Uh, we couldn't get Cycle's own MVPs to come and uh, fix it, so it just became a real issue. And that that meant that gave us a lot, actually, a lot of impetus to to move on. Um, and but we and we had to do it very speedily. Uh, but I think an interesting thing is that the, some of the issues we had with it were kind of baked in from the start, just from the way it was conceived. So this idea that um, you do a big launch, uh, you heavy on business requirements, you big investment, and then uh, you have a big launch party. Uh, and the moment you, my finger is showing you how much money you're spending, by the way. <laughs> you have a big launch party, and as soon as you launch, your money's dried up, but, and only then do you start to learn what, how people interact with it. So your site is in a perpetual state of decay, and you end up with these boom and bust redesign cycles um and, and your site is is always operating uh, is always underperforming and i think we recognize that and i think we tried to the way we approached the new website was, was in such a way that we would kind of avoid some of those mistakes so we worked off a roadmap we did very short sprints picking off one thing at a time we had a big discovery phase and a phase launch i think to kind of yeah avoid some of the mistakes that perhaps 10 years ago were more common. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I guess most people um, who've joined today are aware, you know, compared to five, 10 years ago, the, the content management system market is you know, a lot more crowded. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear just a little bit more about um, how you started your evaluation and what sort of criteria yeah. you used. So I, we started with a kind of framework of four key principles that I just ripped off the government, the, the GDS website. So these, I kind of rattle them off uh, all the time actually. So here we go. Number one is that 
any system we use needs to allow us to like constantly iterate, which is the pompous way of saying we need to be able to make changes, obviously. Uh, number two was that you should have a low cost of ownership, so low running costs, so that we can afford to make the changes we, we need to make. Um, and that also kind of hints towards it's going to probably be open source, which, which means your code becomes portable. You can uh, use numbers of different third, third parties and develop quite interesting relationships. Number three was that it should be managed by the team who operates it, which sounds like obvious, but I think sometimes in a complex organization like Oxfam or when your tools don't necessarily work properly, um, decision making can sometimes fall to IT departments or uh, senior budget holders. Um, but I think web, web teams need to make decisions on websites. And then there's a whole other webinar involved in the role of web teams. Um, but yeah, that's for another day. Uh, number four is that your tool should allow you to develop relationships with third parties who have a culture of collaboration. And so for some people that might be pair programming. For us, we've, we we um, learned a lot from Torchbox about different user testing techniques. Um, and I kind of think it's, it's important not just to think about the technology, we try to think about the partnerships around it and doors it would open. Um, so, but all, those four principles, basically, the overarching theme is that we need to be able to react. We need to be able to react to changes in the environment, uh, screen sizes, or um, you know, user behavior changes. Uh, and because of the only, I think that's the key attribute of a good website is just how it reacts to change. Because that's the only thing we know is going to happen is that change. And we all know that now. Change. Um, was it? Was it? I don't know. If it's known unknowns or unknown unknowns. Um, it was one of them. Uh, we have to re react to events all the time. So we might launch, uh, last week we launched a petition um, in response to the government's 0.7% paid budget cut. Uh, we've had um, we've had a pandemic, so all our shops shut. I mean, no way we could anticipate that. So uh, yeah, we need, these are the sort of things we need to be able to react to. And I apologize for quoting Donald Rumsfeld, but I, um, I did find myself when we were, doing this in 2019, uh, Brexit was at its zenith. And I was, I found myself going around Oxfam talking about taking control of our website and unleashing our potential, which is just uh, parroting some of the things I heard. But actually that, that is like the nub of it. We need control of our tools and which we didn't have. So any new tool would have to, you know, we'd have to be able to bend it to our will basically. Okay. And with these, these four principles in mind, it'd be interesting to just hear a bit more about um, which CMSs in particular you, you homed in on in the early stages and sort of who made it onto the shortlist. Yeah, so that, that gave us a shortlist of um, WordPress, uh, Drupal, Umbraco or Umbraco, I don't know how to pronounce it, and um, Wagtail. Uh, and so if a CMS met, sort of fell into the framework of four principles, um, we then had five new criteria, which the five S's were uh, security, support, speed, something, no, uh, simplicity, which is very important, and Salesforce integration. Okay. So, so we were moving towards Salesforce there so th at that point. So um, integration with Salesforce was a big selling point. Now, uh, I think at this point, it's quite hard to articulate the pressure we were under to move fast. So we, because um, our system was collapsing around our ears. So, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, what we chose to do was to rank the CMSs in, in, in order and then pick up, and then we wanted to, um, we, so we, luckily we had experience of all of these and we did some research and we installed them all. So we ranked them and then we chose to run a proof of concept on the favourite and kind of work down on the understanding that if it didn't work, we go down to the next one. So um, what we definitely wanted to do was to try before we buy. And the clear favourite in that list was Wagtail. Um, and I know this isn't a sales pitch for Wagtail, but I, I should tell you the reason, I'll list the reasons why we liked it. So it's very strong on security, Had a it has a very good UI, which I think we're going to show later. Um, it's lightweight, which makes it really fast. And um, it doesn't see, it doesn't have any um, 
redundancy, like for example, WordPress, and those are redundant database calls all over the place. Um, and it was just refreshing to see something that was completely unopinionated and flexible. It's like basically when you first install Wagtail, you don't see very much, but it's like you're, but very quickly you can get it, something quite exciting to happen. So it's like you're opening a huge box of potential. Um, and it gives us a very high ceiling. And I, I really, I, I just need the CMS to get out of the way because I think our content is what we need, to, what makes our site a winning site. Um, and I'm probably not going to be seduced by fancy features and bells and whistles. So, uh, so yeah, so we embarked upon this project where we, we picked off part of our website, uh, which I think we're going to talk about later. Um, yeah, so I, I can't really tell people which tools are the best for them. It's up to their individual circumstances. But my one piece of advice would be that if it is possible, um, try before you buy and work on a genuine project. So pick off part of your website that isn't working very well because you're not you don't just want to replace like for like. Try and improve part of your website. Um, and what I didn't want to do was invite sales teams in to pitch potentially over promise and not deliver because I, I we've done that before. And it doesn't really work. And I, don't, I just don't think traditional procurement processes are suitable for websites because websites aren't commodities. And this is quite an important point, which I some I fail to communicate, but I'm going to try and do this succinctly. Um, when we're building our website, we don't think of it as a capital asset, think of it as an operational thing. So we're not really building a thing at all. We're not launching a thing. We're kind of building a way of working and the content management system needs to just oil the wheels, really. Um, another draw quickly was the quality another draw of wagtail was the quality of um, contributions from the community so there's a community of sites with quite similar requirements to oxfam websites of a similar ilk so often public sector or charity and it it just seems to be that because it's quite niche it has a, a quite of higher bar for the code and um, we already for example have started uh, we've benefited benefited already from some of those contributions and actually Oxfam America, I forgot to mention this, we're using Wagtail at this time and they are the people who first put us onto them, so onto it. So um, it came with a very strong recommendation from them. And we actually have a question um, from Oxfam America, from um, Bill Tocaso, so, so thank you for sending this ahead of the session. Um, and he's just curious to know um, how how their project, how the Oxfam America pro uh, project um, and its results influenced um, the Oxfam GB process. Uh, so what time is it in America? Is it, is, that's a pre pre-written question. Yeah, he's not actually on it today. He just sent it ahead of time. I'll send him the recording. Because that means I can I can reveal I've got a sort of secret NGO crush on Oxfam America. I think I've coveted their website for quite a long time. Um, but that so what so Oxfam I should explain is a confederation of lots of Oxfams. Uh, Oxfam GB is obviously the biggest one, but Oxfam America is is um, is, is obviously big in America. <laughs> um, so, but so what happened was we luckily share a look and feel. We have a, like a global brand, or we did have. So Oxfam America were able to just hand over their code base or give us access to their GitHub repository, which meant we gave us a head start on uh, the design sprint we ran, which was the proof of concept for Wagtail. And that was obviously very helpful. I'm very thankful to them, but it also proved the point that um, open source code can reduce running costs. So that was free to us and we were very lucky they did it for us um, but it got us up and running and it meant that um, we didn't have to jump through so many kind of administrative hoops within Oxfam and we could get something done very quickly without getting stuck in the machine but it also kind of opens the door potentially to sharing code further down the line between Oxfams there isn't really a plan to have a central Oxfam website that kind of supports the individual oxide but you could see that if we were all using the same system and it was an open source system that could be potentially something that we might do in 10 years or something so yeah that was great and you mentioned open source there um and there's a few sort of benefits it brings with it but particular reasons that you were leaning towards open source <coughs> oh geez. um yes so so i work for a charity obviously um and we obviously need to keep running costs down. And I often find myself creating pages that say things like 30 pounds can buy a shelter. 
and I don't and because we want to keep our running costs down we want to make sure as much of the money that uh, our generous donors give to us helps people who are vulnerable and I don't I just don't think I, I personally find it quite hard to justify that money going on a license which is just purely for the privilege of using some of the software unless there is a very good reason to do it and I just can't think for a website like mine of a requirement that is so crazy that it needs um, proprietary systems so I would at least default to a first look at open source and if nothing worked then pot potentially use a proprietary system but um, I just think it's just it's just I'm, I'm on a very high moral horse here but um, and I don't mean to be but I do remember once going to a, um, another training session at a large content management systems offices and looking out of the window in the coffee break and seeing the yacht which the CEO who was a few offices up used to commute to work and that, that kind of gave me pause for thought um, but it's it's not just about cost it's about the many other benefits you have so as I said before your code it becomes portable you can um, work with a number of different partners you could recruit your own agency uh, your own um, developers you have a, a hackathon if that's your if that's your thing um, but again as I said before benefiting from the community so we, we have benefited from something Mozilla have already done so that's in the first two months of, of the of using Wagtail we, we also had a very painful upgrade with Cyclone as I mentioned before the upgrade process for Wagtail is like poles apart um, so I get invited to a webinar like this where new features are announced and they're carefully curated and tested by experts in the community and then <clears throat> the upgrade involves no downtime and has meaningful enhancements so it might be an accessibility toolbar might be uh, the last one I think had uh, collections for images that became hierarchical it's good it's like a Christmas present it's great um, and when we talk about open source it also gives me a chance to use the words false dichotomy because it makes it sound very clever um, but it is a false dichotomy you can't put all in 2020 all the open source tools in the same basket because they're all very different and I would encourage people to look at them before looking at very expensive tools that do the same thing there I've got to get off my moral high horse now um and did did the sort of um the open source um you know, take the, <clears throat> the decision to sort of uh move in that direction present any challenges at Oxfam yeah yeah so the obvious one is security so people have traditionally have concerns about the security of open source systems um, now we've got quite a strong security team at Oxfam um, and uh, to be fair they're quite open-minded uh, but obviously rightly cautious about using a content management system that they to be honest have never heard of so I had to reassure them and we spent quite a long time uh, building a case which involved um, I did it a number of ways so I, I remember ringing around the community getting um, getting uh, testimonies from people, for example, from the, I think it's the Electoral Commission of America, and I wrote to the National Cybersecurity Agency as well. Uh, but another thing was to kind of explain that Wagtail is underpinned by a quite a robust framework. The Django framework has built in protections, for example, against cross-site scripting attacks. So I'm not an expert in this by now, I have access a lot of AMP acronyms, CR, CSRF, XSS, all these different things. Anyway, it's great. Um, and there are also many ver there are various like impartial directories of uh, security vulnerabilities logged against different systems. I think it's called the CVE database. And Django comes out of that very well indeed. You can compare the history of different systems. And that's, that gave us some independent metrics of how secure it was. Uh, but obviously security is an ongoing concern. So, um, we have to had to we brought Torchbox's developers in to have a kind of any question answered session so to make sure that code practices were adhered to and that we were comfortable with the code that we were going to add on top of Django um, in, within Wagtail so we have this kind of open invite within Oxfam uh, any questions answered and then that was followed I think by a security interview as well we've also done pen tests we've done two pen tests one on our pilot that we ran which had a couple of minor um, issues, which is to be expected. But then the 
did a pen test on the la on the wider websites, which which included the donation system, and there were no errors at all, which is unprecedented, at least for Oxfam. And um, I think we thought that there was a problem with pen test, but it was so good. Um, but we we regularly run scans on on a monthly basis. We run scans, and we recently had a PCI audit, uh, and that went very well as well. So I think we pretty much covered security off. But it did it does it did take some time. Yeah. But I think it, we demonstrated that we I think made the right choice. So quite a few sort of steps to work through, yeah. but it sounds like they did the trick in alleviating those concerns yeah. and sort of giving the wider team the confidence to to move forwards. Um, cool. And then I know you mentioned as part of the sort of decision making process, one of the first things you did was take part in a design sprint. Um, and for anybody joining who's not familiar with design sprints, they're an absolutely fantastic um, sort of tried and tested way of validating product ideas in in a really short amount of time, usually about five days. Um, and the concept, concept came out of Google Ventures, championed by Jake Knapp. Um, and basically you start on day one on the Monday where you establish your goal. Um, and as a sort of as a team, um, usually sort of bringing in wider members of, of the organization, um, you map out your path to achieving that goal. Um, and then going into the second day, um, you sketch out a ton of ideas, everybody's sketching, it's, it's loads of fun. Um, and then you start to, as a group, home in on which of the ideas you want to take forwards. Um, and then you actually create a prototype, um, usually a sort of interactive prototype. And then on the final day, you test that with real users um, to sort of come back and validate your idea. Um, so Theo, be great if you could just tell us what you chose to focus on for your sprint. Uh, yeah, so the <clears throat> the subject to our sprint was our volunteer recruitment process for Oxfam shops. So Oxfam has about 600 high street shops around the country, um, more than Sainsbury's. Well, at one point it was more than Sainsbury's. Um, uh, and previously, although online, the the um, the shops are all run by volunteers, and the the process to recruit volunteers was evolved. People going to our website, downloading a Word document, filling it in, printing it going to the shop, queuing up, probably being told by the manager to do it again because they'd done it wrong. Um, it was like the worst ex user experience you could design. So we thought that, that, as I mentioned before, was the area of the website we would pick off and improve with this uh, to try a system. But So the design sprint was to rectify that, but there was a hidden agenda, which was to test not just the technology, but the relationship and ways of working with Torchbox. Um, so for, for Oxfam, it was really good, and for Oxfam, it, I think, and this is a bit of a caricature, but it is a very different way of working because we often, if we've got an issue like that, we do a very top-down project where we'll have a creative brainstorm, come up with a slogan and then a photo shoot and do more advertising. Uh, but this, in contrast, was kind of a bottom-up thing where we had, um, we focused on user requirements. So we, I remember we'd, our office had had a horrendous flood and we were out in the office for several months and I'd spent, I'd taken advantage of that and done a little tour of Oxfam shops, interviewing shop managers and volunteers in back rooms. Uh, and we also had, we invited to the first day of the sprint, someone who'd worked in our Batley, Batley hub, which is a distribution center. So we kind of built personas, uh, went through several steps, storyboarding and, and prototyping, and then uh, rented a cafe because we still didn't have an office and did some user testing. And that went very well and I, re I remember actually quite distinctly that on the next day the last day of the sprint we were going through the videos of the user testing um looking at how we might refine it and how we might refine the form we built and I, I was thinking we were gonna come up with a list of jobs to do for maybe to take it forward in the future but oh, I hadn't appreciated that there was a, like a speaker phone in the middle of the table and then in the next room someone was listening to our meeting and um, making the edits live as we as we spoke and it was it was just we'd refresh the page and the changes would be made it was amazing um like yeah anyway so uh the, the the i should also mention the finished prototype did connect to salesforce sandbox so that was the first time i'd actually seen salesforce in action and that was one of the, the top um criteria for trialing a cms so that was brilliant it was one of the best things i've done actually this design sprint in all my time working in web.
That's great to hear. Um, and what did you then decide to do based on the outcomes of the sprint? Uh, yeah, sorry. So um, we, what was good about it is it gave us a ready-made thing. It was demonstrably good. It wasn't quite live, but it, it clearly had great promise. Um, and it was very likely not just to recruit more people, but potentially lower our budget, our spend on advertising. So, and that kind of proof of concept is something I would definitely recommend because it lets you apply UX principles to like management decisions. So if you think, what does my manager value? He values money, which makes him sound like a very craven person. He's, uh, my manager is amazing, lovely chap. Um, and, but he does care about money. Um, so saving money is something he likes. And this meant I could go to him rather than with a request or something, but with something he, he really wanted. Um, so the next steps were then to like build a case to make it production ready. We did all the security stuff, ran a pen test, uh, as I mentioned before. And then we did a launch as a kind of pilot. And within the first month, we had had around a thousand applications, which is amazing for us. And uh, we were able to not just reduce the advertising, but turn it off. And it's like the you know, best conversation I've had with my manager. Marvellous. Uh, so, yeah, really good. But that gave us a lot more momentum to build the wider, to go all in and do the full website. It's, I mean, it's a fantastic result um, coming from the sprint and just to be able to bring such value to, to your volunteers and, and the organisation. Um, so it's, it's great to hear. Um, so then I guess as the title of this webinar rather gives away, um, you decide to take the plunge and, uh, and migrate to Wagtail. Um, I know <clears throat> over a year ago now, um, we started working together on your new website. Um, and we're just so, so excited to see the first um, iteration go live in, in September. Um, but sort of casting, casting minds back to um, the early stage of the project, and we spent a ton of time um, getting to know your supporters and really trying to understand and home in on, on, on what they're looking for. Um, so it'd be good to just sort of hear a bit more about how that these sort of insights and, and research helped to shape the direction of the new site yeah so in the past the site was and i think this is quite common that the website was a reflection of the organization's internal structures so every team would have a page it became like a directory of Oxfam. um and i think we kind of understood in you know 2020 that wasn't the way to do things so we, we did it embrace a user-focused approach here so we did a long discovery phase as you mentioned and the first thing we did was to establish a uh, a user-defined sitemap, so the information architecture. So um, this is to involve, avoid like the endless debate about what goes where uh, and conversations about X can't find Y, where can you move it here and there? Anyway, so um, this is based on the premise that every user of our website, every single person who comes has a task in mind when they arrive. So it might be to hopefully donate, it might be to complain or to find their local shop, but it's it's probably not going to be read Oxfam's latest news or you know so we went through this process of establishing what those tasks were this is the top tasks process the Jerry McGovern thing but um, we did it ourselves uh, so we did uh, lots of interviews with public facing teams we did we've got a supporter panel we kind of uh, used that we I remember sitting in cafes in Oxford um, just surveying opinion, trying to find out why people would come to our site. So we ended up with a list of about 150 tasks, which we whittled down, and then we did lots of cl closed and open card sorting sessions, and uh, we came up with quite a robust navigation system that I think reflects not Oxfam, but the needs of its users. And I think building a website around users is a good thing to do, but a great thing to do is to involve users in creating it. Um, and I think that gives you, it kind of future proofs it. Um, so the other one, another good thing was we had the corresponding people on each side. So on the agency side and our side. So we had, um, because, well, it became very useful with pandemics, et cetera, everyone being working remotely, but we had a delivery manager on both sides. Ours predominantly was wrangling people, trying to get the right people in the room, which was good. There was yourself, product director, and myself, product owner. Um, and we have a technical design architect as well, who works with Torchbox developers, because we do the hosting 
So there's, there's a lot, it was a real team effort um, and worked really well. We also had senior buy-in from the head of Oxfam, Danny, who is our leader, another smashing chap. And um, uh, so he gave us kind of the vision for the character of the site early on, which is very human, trying to get the Oxfam voice out. So we've got a lot of first-hand accounts from people we work with on the ground. And that, so you're kind of greeted by um, people rather than the kind of corporate voice. That was great. Mm. Was there anything else that you think worked particularly well? Um, and then also on the flip side, with the benefit of hindsight, anything that you would change if you were to be starting again next week? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a job interview question where I'm going to talk about <laughs> the things, the mistakes and present them as challenges that we overcame. <laughs> but we had, uh, so the whole thing was beset by challenges. So even from the very first day of the the um, design sprint, so as I said, we have a flood. So we were out of the office, remote working before it became fashionable. Um, and now we all are. Uh, so one of the key issues there was that I, I went on furlough at a crucial point, which as did a number of my colleagues, and that exposed, I think, a lack of documentation on my part, which actually I don't I think that's quite the case. I think it was a lack of telling people where the documentation was. Um, but thankfully we'd established uh, kind of principles to work through early on. So we have design sprint principles, we've got the sustainable technology principles I mentioned, we've got OKRs, uh, objectives and key results, which were success metrics that were established early on. Um, and that kind of meant we could carry on without disruption, even though there was quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, but you know, if we're talking about actual mistakes, I don't think there were any clangers because we built on a quite a solid foundation of user requirements, as I said, and we, we, the way we broke the project up mitigated a lot of the risk. I remember, so a website is about making mistakes. It's about ironing out wrinkles because we're optimizing. So um, that is the business of a, running a good website. And that, yeah, so we're, we're not treating it as a monolithic, project with a beginning and middle and an end, and then we have to have the flex to make mistakes. Mistakes are inevitable because it's a, we're building a way of working, not a thing. So that's my job interview answer. Where I... <laughs> Got the job, perfect. Um, no, and I would just agree, I think having, um, to your point, I think having yourself, and I'm not just saying this because you uh, agreed to do this webinar, um, but having yourself as a sort of highly engaged product owner um, from the Oxfam team, um, was hugely important, I think, um, to the success of the process and um, just in terms of being able to feedback um, really quickly, make decisions um, while sort of involving, you know, the, the relevant stakeholders and teams um, at, at the right points. Um, and this also meant that we were able to run a you know, pretty intense um, dual track schedule where we had design and discovery sprints running for a period of time alongside the build sprints. Yeah. Um, which, you know, ultimately it gave us, you know, a great deal of flexibility, but meant that we were launch ready much, much sooner, um, which was, you know, I think, I think worked well. Um, I know we're running out of time a little bit, so um, we'll, we'll just rush through the, the last couple of questions and then hopefully still have time for you to, um, to show us around the site quickly. Um, so I think as um, you know, a lot of uh, product people find it can be really tough to define the MVP, even you know, with the research at your fingertips. And <clears throat> the term MVP itself can can be a bit contentious at times. But could you just talk us quickly through this sort of approach that you took to prioritisation? Yes. So the quick answer, in interest of time, is that um, our priorities now become user requirements. So the user's priorities become our priorities, and. At the uh, the top tasks we mentioned um, should form the basis of our work. Uh, so we found in the top tasks thing quickly that um, people are very interested, and there was a clear winner in this um, process. People are more interested in Oxfam's like bread and butter work, the impact of our work in in the world. We're not whereas we tend to focus a lot internally on marketing campaigns and things. People just want to know the basics, um, and so we kind of wove that into our business requirements and into our donation journey. Um, so that will continue, I hope to be the underpin um, the prioritization process and look at what people really want. Uh, so we have a we have a public engagement strategy that actually 
is very helpful in that it is user focused. It talks about tailoring our um, communications to the needs of people or allowing people to get involved with Oxfam in any way they like. So we have a lottery, we've got lots of events, et cetera. Um, but crudely, these fall into three categories, time, money, and voice. So time is volunteering, voice is campaigning, but um, the kind of first among equals is money, obviously. So we, uh, yeah, so refinements to our donation forms have already actually happened. Um, and so they, they, they tend to be the priority, but um, I think it's helpful to launch an MVP just because it kind of helps communicate with my colleagues that we are growing a website. We don't launch websites, we grow websites. There's a sound bite for you. <laughs> um, and so lastly then, um, now you've sort of launched your first iteration and uh, continue to enhance and, and grow and build the site. Um, just be good to hear how it's going and how you're tracking against some of the key goals that you established um, that you wanted to achieve. <coughs> Yes, uh, very quickly. So all the feedback I had actually when the site went live is 100% of it is about what it looks like, which is not what we report. <laughs> It'd be great if I could report on how much more beautiful I've made it that month, but that isn't our KPI. The KPIs are tend to be conversion. So we have uh, our initial conversion rates went up like big spike as soon as we launched. But since uh, since we launched, we've we've improved them more by we looked at the postcode validation on iPhones and that pushed it up by about two or three percent again. Um, we used to have a lot of manual processing behind the scenes for donations and that's now modernized, that's gone. Uh, we've found that integrating in memory donations where you, where you give a gift on in memory of someone you love uh, who may have died, we found that has gone up but and that I think is because we've now integrated it into our form whereas before it was like an in its own little silo. Uh, we've the, the challenge for us now is that to, in order to be GDPR compliant, we now have a consent, a cookie consent banner. And we found that only about 30% of people are opting in to analytics cookies, which is lower than I think we anticipated. And so, but now we're quite relaxed about it. And, well, I'm quite relaxed about it <laughs> because I consider it as, a, we're now sampling our audience. So we're not talking about volumes. We can get that kind of stuff from CRM, the volumes of donations and, interact and engagements but uh yeah so we're just sampling but that that is a challenge at the moment that's amazing thank you theo um would you be happy to just dive into a really quick demo um and show us your site in action and then hopefully yeah. we'll still have the last 10 minutes or so to address the the many questions i've seen bubbling up as we've gone along oh goodness let me um log in quickly thanks i hope this goes well Hang on, where have we gone? Uh, share screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Is that working? We yeah. can. Yeah, we'll be right. Here we go. So this is uh, one of our donation forms. Previously, we um, had our donations lived in a separate kind of platform, um, but we've brought them in, which, as I mentioned, has improved our conversion rate already. Uh, we uh, we find we found what we did in the past. Our approach tended to be to put as much information in these pages as possible, um, but we've slimmed that down because we found that people uh, people get their news from somewhere else. The user already knows there's a coronavirus issue and wants to come here to give money. So this is the thing about people arriving with a task in mind, and we need to recognise that. So I'm just going to show you the the. Um, Back end of this. So I'm going to click the little bird here that gives me access to Wagtail and it lands me on the right page. And this is the behind the scenes. So we have, uh, the, we've commissioned these tabs. So we these are built for our, to our requirements. And the, the, the little form widget you see at the top um, is controlled by this tab. And I'll just quickly add something and just show you how quick it is. So I'm going to add the ability to give a uh, regular like a monthly direct debits as well as a credit card payment. I'm just going to make up some amounts uh, and then I save that and I'm going to preview it. So you can now see we've got a monthly option has appeared and we can now within like what was that 20 seconds I can now do this. I don't know how long that would have taken before. Uh, I could also show you something else which I think is a 
a big, um, there's a really great feature of Wagtail is something called stream field. So if I want to add a component, I've got lots of options. And again, a lot of these are commissioned by us uh, and you can build pretty much anything you want. So there's some standard ones, uh, paragraphs, headings, images, etc. But there are also some more complex ones. So this one is a donate widget I'm just going to put in. Um, you can then choose what's called a snippet. These are reusable items that we've built elsewhere. We can use across the site. Uh, and I'll, I'll pick this one, it's probably the wrong one, but I'm not going to go live, so it's fine. And I'll just show you what the this, this snippet contains. So here I've got um, I've got uh, all the details I need to populate, all the content I need to populate that. And I'll, I'll now show you what it looks like. Uh, so we've got the monthly thing still there. And we've now got this donate widget. So we can use this, we probably wouldn't use it in this page, but we, we can use this throughout the website to, be, to allow people to kind of jump into the donation process. And if you fill this in, you would end up on like page two of the four. So that kind of makes the user journey much more efficient. And these, this, uh, we can, we can, it's, it's brilliant. We can just, if we want something, we can have it. It's just so flexible. It's marvelous. Um, there you go. I'm going to stop sharing now. That's great. Thanks, Theo. Um, and also just thank you so much for sharing um, such great insight into the journey you've been on um, over the past year or so. Um, so. Lisa, um, looks like we've got some questions. Um, where do you want us to start? We do have some questions. Hello, uh, let me, so like I said before, any that we don't get to answer, I will follow up in an email with them because we have had quite a few, which is great. Yeah. So the first question we have is from Stephanie at Beat Eating Disorders. What have been the key benefits that you've seen since moving to Wagtail? Um, better engagement, speed, flexibility, what would you say? Uh, well, one of the top um, top ones is running costs. So running costs before, as I mentioned before, we need technology that's sustainable and we couldn't really afford to do anything other than try and keep up with bugs before. So now running costs are right down. And when we launched the website, here's a little insight into my life. It was my birthday. I haven't told anyone that. So I went to get my lunch. I upgraded to Sainsbury, not Sainsbury, Waitrose. Upgraded to Waitrose. And on that day, that was the first day ever that my lunch had cost more than our website. So the running costs have like done the opposite of skyrocketing. We've gone right down. That's the one thing. Uh, the other is the speed at which I can make pages. Uh, previously, it would just take, it would be very arduous to create a page and now it's super fast. So, and I can, I can even do it within, in a, like a, a Teams meeting. I can be kind of, people can describe what they want and it will be ready by the end of the meeting. People are amazed. Uh, I think also the it, it is a struggle sometimes to get um, the organisational rituals to change to kind of focus on users as opposed to business requirements. But I think we are getting there. Um, but in terms of like analytics, the conversion rates are up. So it's in we've got more people going from our homepage to our online shop than we had in the past, um, which is a key thing. Despite the redesign, maybe making the online shop less prominent, it's now clearer and it kind of makes more sense in the position it's in. So yes, they're the key things. But if you, I mean, we just drop me an email and we can chat more if you want to talk more about it. Thanks, Theo. Um, and we've got a question from Claire at the Marine Conservation Society who said, was it difficult to persuade the board not to go down the traditional procurement process route? Yes, <laughs> yes, it was. Um, I think it does help though that the tool is open source because it doesn't cost, the tool itself doesn't cost anything. Um, so you kind of, there's, you know, that, that helps. Also it helps that I've got a very supportive uh, management team, um, but yes, it is hard, but it's well worth it. Brilliant, um, glad to hear it. We also have a question from Nina who asked, how long had you been using Sitecore before? Uh, I think it's very nearly 10 years. Um, so we did, in pre prior to Sitecore, we didn't have a content management system at all, um, uh, which is, I think was even then a bit odd. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it was about 10 years off, I, but I think that was 
quite a lot, many years too long. Um, and how did you handle migration from the old site to the new website from Saeed at Diabetes UK? Uh, yeah, so I think it's, this is a good question. So we didn't migrate, and I think that's important. So websites do tend to grow organically over time. Um, and I just don't, I think if you're going to launch a new website, it, it, it's time to have a good look at your content and see if it's, it's unlikely, I think, to, to still work. So I think it's time to take a fresh look at what you're doing. Uh, so we didn't really migrate. Our site it used to have about 5,000 pages and now it's got in the low hundreds. I think we need to make the funnel a bit smaller, funnel people to their, you know, to their goals more easily. Brilliant, thank you. You ready for another? Sorry, it's like quick fire questions. Actually. Yeah, yeah. You're handling them well, you're batting them all back. Which is nice. um, we've got one from Will Churchill at the Esme Fairbank, Fairbank Foundation. Um, and he says, we've recently gone from a .NET framework site to Wagtail, which has been great for us in terms of usability. Um, what was the biggest benefit of Wagtail that your team has taken advantage of? Did you answer that one already before? Or is that something? Um, the team has taken advantage of is I think my team is have found just the speed speed of building pages is is a relief. That's it really. Um, so we had I could my team uh, is made up of three people and we've kind of there's a, an editor and two kind of producers. So we in the past would have created WordPress sites, HTML, JavaScript, etc. But we're not fully fledged developers. So we use uh, Torchbox for development. But the plan is that we will be um, we'll be training and potentially recruiting our own developers when this uh, horrendous world event has has stopped and our shops are open again. Um, yeah. So. But for, for us at the moment, it's speed of creating pages. Brilliant. You kind of answered two questions there as well, because well, there's been a few queries about your internal team and how you manage the development between Torchbox and Oxfam as well. Um, but I might follow up with that one. We've got one um, who has asked about, could you explain open source technology versus proprietary for the benefit of non-techie people here? Uh, Tom might be better to explain. Yeah. He's probably done it many times. Sure. So, uh, I mean, open source means a few things. Perhaps most importantly for uh, for some people, it's that it's free. So, open source software is is software that has uh, has a particular kind of license, and there are a few different open source licenses. But the the things that make that they all have in common are that they are free, to, and uh, that uh, you can adapt them. So um, anyone could, can take Wagtail and build their own site on it or even build their own service using it and call it something else. And in fact, that's already happened. And uh, they don't have to, to, to pay the creators. And um, that also means the, the openness of it means that although it's not always the case, it, it usually is the case, and this is true with Wagtail, that uh, you have many contributors. So instead of having one agency that's in charge, um, like uh, Adobe or the people who make Sitecore or something like that, then uh, you have this wide community with people contributing and, and making it better from all around the world. Probably things like uh, Drupal and WordPress are probably the, the, the most famous examples of, of open source content management systems. Yeah, and kind of the knee jerk reaction to that, to hearing that maybe for the first time is that, oh, it can't be secure because everyone's got access to it. But actually, the fact that many eyes are on it means that bringing like significant security issues just aren't a problem because they've got so many people kind of it would be spotted is that right <laughs> so. i think it is right and it is a bit counterintuitive at first and it's something that people might feel nervous about because uh, because the code for the platform that's that's underlying your site is is open source but generally the the outcome is that more eyes means more security and in fact something i'd encourage and Oxfam aren't ready to do this yet, but I, I do try and encourage our clients is to open source their actual websites so that the the whole the code for the whole site is available. And um, that means partly it's kind of good for the community because it means other people can can take the bits that of, of your site that, that are going to you know help them speed it up as well. But also the you may even get other people contributing to your to your own site, and we've seen that quite a lot in other cases. Thank you, Tom, and Theo. I think we've got time just for one more. I'm going to squeeze one more in for you. So um, 
based on the top-down evaluation approach with Wagtail at the top, did you not then evaluate any other platforms due to Wagtail ticking all the boxes? So we had, well, the, we had kind of some experience with the others already, but, um, and we kind of, and we also worked with a number of agencies because we'd had this issue with Sitecore. Um, we had this approach where we had lots of, um, lots of small things loosely joined. So we'd, we used WordPress, uh, members of my team had used Drupal before, and uh, we worked with a number of agencies, as I said. So we kind of felt that by proxy, we'd run trials already. And so we did a little bit of a post hoc kind of uh, review. Um, but but um, speed was of the essence at the time, and Wagtail was a clear favourite. Um, and to have the architects of Wagtail just down the road was also great. Um, so yeah, so we didn't have very long. I've just got one more. I'm just going to squeeze yep. one more in, sorry. <laughs> We've got one from Andrew Holgate, who is from um, the World Food Programme, who said, how much of the success of the project was due to Wagtail itself and how much was the vendor chosen for the design, development and implementa implementation? <laughs> uh, I think it's hard to separate them. Um, yeah, I don't think we can. I think, I don't know, I can't say. I'd like to think I was involved as well. <laughs> wasn't just at all in the agency but no I think it's hard to hard to um, separate them I do think uh, yeah I can't I can't say you can just say both that's fine. both yeah both it's like yeah <laughs> like to finish on anyway <laughs> so we're at 11 o'clock so thank you everybody for coming and joining us um hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful um and as I say I will follow up with an email as well for anything we've referenced and any outstanding questions as well and thank you Theo well, no, thank you Thank you, Theo. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much. Cheers.